What are we finding now as we're studying genetics? What are, what are kind of the things that we see now that we didn't see 50 years ago? Well, 50 years ago, they had the simple idea that you have a gene and a gene makes a protein. That's been blown out of the water. We now know that genes are involved in making dozens, if not hundreds of proteins and different pieces of genes are used in different proteins at different times in the cell cycle, different times in life, under different conditions, in different cells. Most of your cells in your body, they produce similar proteins and other cells, but they're different. Huh. So your brain cells actually produce different versions of proteins than your liver cells produce. So how is that possible? I mean, how, is it, how do they do that? It's, it's dynamic programming. Hmm. You have a gene and this piece is used over here or over there or over there. And there's little teeny programs inside the DNA that control when and where and how to use that piece. Mm -hmm. But just recently I read a paper about um, actually shifting of the information in the genes. So if you start at, at letter number one, you can read out this information. If you start at letter number two, you get a to totally different information. How on earth did that evolve like that? I mean, if you think of, um, if you read a story, maybe you're, you're reading a story talking about some swashbuckling pirate. Mm -hmm. But if you start the second letter, letter, it's a chocolate chip cookie recipe. We can't write that. We, there's no way we could intelligently program multiple levels of information into the same story. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see in life. And if we can't do it intelligently, it's not gonna happen randomly. We're talking about something that is beyond imagination in terms of the complexity. Yeah. Even from the standpoint of the kind of things we've uh, done with software, and we've done some amazing things with software, but yeah. that, that appears to be is, is not even close to what you're talking about. I would like to say the genome is four-dimensional. Hmm. In software, we write in lines of code. Correct. Well, in mathematics, we learned a line is a one-dimensional object. It right. just has length. Mm -hmm. So you could actually take a computer program and just write from left to right for millions of characters. Now, on our screens, we put carriage returns in there so we can read it. But the computer doesn't know that. It, it ignores the carriage returns. It's just a line. Well, DNA is a line. So in the naive concept of DNA, we had a, a line that had information in it. Mm -hmm. But it's not simple like that. Because this piece of DNA makes a little protein that comes over here and sticks on this piece of DNA over here, which turns on or turns off a gene. Oh my goodness, it's like self-modifying code. Oh, it's worse than that. Because this piece <laughs> of DNA over here makes just an RNA that goes over here and interferes with this gene's RNA. They stick together, they interfere, they conflict with one another, they turn things on, they turn things off. And if you want to draw that out, you need a sheet of paper, a very big sheet of paper. You'd have to write all the letters of DNA out on all three billion of them. Uh, it would take, I, I calculated, about 850 Bibles as one human genome. And then you have to draw lines or arrows from one part to another part because this part turns this part off, this part interferes with this, this part enhances this. It's this huge two-dimensional interaction network. And that's where you have a two-dimensional genome. So it sounds like, I mean, let me stop here All for right. a second because this is really amazing to think about this because um, I think in terms of a computer program that it's fairly static. I mean, yeah. the instructions are there, but you're talking about a program that is reprogramming itself. Oh. It's modifying its own instructions. Oh, wait till I get to the fourth dimension. Oh, okay. It's because of the third dimension first. The, the genome also folds into a three-dimensional shape. And so it's a, a 3D, the third dimension is, is actually the shape. And the genes that are buried inside this ball of DNA, they're not active, they're turned off. The genes that are exposed are the ones that are used. So whoever programmed that, that string knew when it folded up which genes will be available at what time. I say, are you saying that when this instruction set folds onto itself, it creates a whole new set of instructions? Yeah, absolutely. And That's the, mind boggling. The information in that first dimension, that linear string, has to be organized in such a way that when it folds into the third dimension, it still works. Oh, well, that's amazing. But it's, it's, it's so, it's amazing. When, when they first sequenced the human genome, sometimes scientists sat down, they did something I would have done. They said, okay, let's look at genes that we know are used in a biochemical pathway. They might like 10 genes in a row to convert this into something over here. Well, if I was programmed it, I would have stuck them right next to each other in the genome. So they looked and they weren't next to each other. They're random. They said, these genes are used on 
different chromosomes are backwards, they're forwards, they're just, they said, look at all the evidence of evolution, it's just junk. Random changes uh, over millions of years, throw all this stuff together willy-nilly, it's just nonsense. And we've heard that a lot. We've, we've heard, heard that a whole lot. Junk DNA. Yes, but then someone figured out how to look at the genome in three dimensions. First of all, they realized the genome folds in a fractal pattern. Hmm. And it's beautiful. But it's in a fractal pattern that doesn't make knots. And so it folds up, and when they figured out where the, the genes were, Genes that are used together are next to each other in 3D space. Oh, Even if they're on different chromosomes, when the chromosomes fold, they bring those two genes next to each other, and usually this cluster of genes is right next to a nuclear pore. So when God programmed these genes, he knew that when he had to turn all these genes on, he needed them in three-dimensional space next to each other. So the whole biochemical pathway can be turned on, the little things are, are copied into RNA, the RNA comes outside the nucleus, it's turned into protein, Voila. Oh, that's amazing. Okay, so you're, you've about blown my mind with that, but you said there's another dimension. Here. Oh yeah, the fourth dimension is time. And how does that work? The genome changes shape over time. Remember I said the genes, some genes are buried? Yeah. And some are exposed, well, you need those buried genes at some time. And so at different stages of development, or sleeping versus waking, or stress versus non-stress, or after you, maybe you eat something that's bad for you, and your liver says, I can get rid of that toxin. Now, your earlobes, they don't care. They don't know what to do. But your liver says, I know what to do. The chromosomes in the liver will change shape, expose that new protein gene, make copies of it, build a brand new protein that can kill off that toxin. And when it's not needed anymore, they'll change shape again and fold back. Oh my goodness. So what you're saying is that we could look at this I mean, from a very simple perspective, and come up with the phrase called junk DNA. Yes. And then we can even look at it when it's folded, even though that is complex, and say, oh, there's still some strange things in there. But you're saying, if it's not being used, we might not recognize its importance. True. Until it is. But some of the information in the genome is like scaffolding in the building. The reason this piece of DNA is here is because when it falls into the three dimensions, it needs these two genes to be next to each other. Right. So this stretch here might not have a functional protein associated with it, but it still has a function. It's very important. Mm. So most of the so-called junk DNA has been brought into the functional category, just not in the way the standard paradigm predicted. And it's funny because the more amazing, the more complex things become, the harder it is for the standard paradigm to explain it. Mm. That three-dimensional ball of DNA changes over the fourth dimension. But the interaction networks in that second dimension, they change. Because this gene turns off, well that affects this one over here, this one no longer talks to that one over there. But it's, worse, it's, it's even more complicated than that. It's the first dimension, that linear string, yeah. the program changes. Uh, now now computer getting... software people, they don't like programs no. that dynamically rewrite themselves. You get all sorts of catastrophe, but we've learned that in the human brain, Brain cells have different genomes to other brain cells. There are these little pieces of DNA that they actually, they make a circle and they pop out and they go over and they float somewhere else in the genome and they stick themselves in there and they turn genes on and they turn genes off. And now we have different pieces of DNA in different brain cells and that directs what type of brain cell it will become. But our liver cells, they have different genomes also. There's a lot of chromosomal duplications that happen in the liver. Because if you need a biochemical pathway and a lot of it, well, make extra copies of those protein genes. But different liver cells have different copies of different chromosomes. And we've learned that in the mouse embryo, there's a jumping gene, a junk piece of DNA, an ancient viral infection, the standard paradigm says, which is boulder dash. It's not true. Because this little piece of DNA has to excise itself and jump around in the mouse embryo to turn genes on and turn genes off. And if you deactivate that little piece of DNA, you don't get development, it stops. Okay. So it's necessary in the mouse. It's probably something similar also probably Ooh. happens in us. Huh. Dynamic programming, all three levels change in the fourth level time. 
Rob, that's, that's, uh, that's so far beyond anything that we know, even in our most complex software systems, that it, it's almost beyond imagination to think that someone would look at that and say it all happened by chance. Yes, and it only brings glory to God. It does.